about 10 years ago, maybe a little more, um, there were a group of researchers, uh, kind of an NCOA group that was really interested in uh, digital culture. And, and when I say digital culture, I, I don't mean technology per se, but I mean uh, sort of the, the, the social ecologies that exist around technology, especially a lot of the kinds of uh, emergent online communities. So a lot of the, the big early pioneers around like, what is the internet going to be and how awesome is it going to be um, for, for online community and digital culture? Uh, there was sort of a, another angle to those people people that were people interested in that stuff, but sort of coming from the perspective of learning and education. And um, the intersection between those spaces for us is really interesting, and we're going to maybe chart a really quick story about how that happened and what uh, how Hive Learning Networks, which is kind of these big collectives of city-based institutions of youth-serving organizations, sort of emerged from that and some of the dynamics involved in those spaces um, in terms of their interaction with digital culture and supporting young people's learning around technology. So these kinds of scholars that I referred to earlier that were interested in learning and digital culture in online spaces, they looked at places like World of Warcraft and they looked at places like you know, fan fiction communities, you know, uh, up in your books, writing your fan fiction for you. Um, partly because these were really rich uh, places with uh, dynamic social practices that really focused on creating um, meaningful things that had uh, very strong community norms. And uh, it was all, they were also important because there were places that young people were starting to inhabit and there was starting to be some, you know, importance in understanding what youth's digital lives were. And certainly a lot of, you know, Dana's work um, focused on this and there was some really groundbreaking research uh, that I know Dana was deeply involved in around hanging out, messing around, geeking out. It was a project led by Mimi Ito and a, a whole host of researchers over three years that looked at sort of the, both the social lives of kids uh, as well as how they kind of geeked out with technology. And so there was an interest in looking at these online spaces for those reasons to understand how digital lives of kids were changing uh, and what it might mean for education. But there was also kind of looking at these spaces from the perspective of like, what do we have to learn from them? So if scholars like Jim G, who's uh, a mentor of Dixie and mine, uh, looked at places like video game ecologies and said, okay, what are these space is doing vis-a-vis -vis learning that's actually something we might be able to learn from uh, and, and might be able to port in some of those structures and practices into uh, places that don't have them. So uh, Jim and his longtime collaborator and partner uh, Betty Hayes talked about learning and affinity spaces and open networks uh, as being kind of characterized by certain things that usually schools aren't characterized by. So having uh, varied ways to participate, having uh, a situation in a real world context where you actually need to apply knowledge to something you care about as opposed to some decontextualized uh, problem set. Um, learning that's just in time as opposed to just in case. Uh, experts and noobs sharing the same spaces. Uh, leadership that's porous and negotiated and feedback being kind of rich in these online ecologies. And obviously this is a little bit of an ideal, idealized model we know that uh, Many online spaces are not always characterized by uh, such, such lofty goals and lofty ideals. But I think what, part of what they were doing here was looking at these spaces and asking, OK, if, A, for the kids that are involved in these spaces, um, they have some pretty interesting opportunities. And how can we provide those opportunities to people that might not have access to these spaces? And how might we be able to refashion our learning environments in general based on some principles from these spaces? Um, Henry Jenkins uh, talked about this kind of participation gap that you know, there, it was sort of a, a more of a sociocultural spin on the digital divide, uh, that there's going to be a whole new set of literacies around technology that are going to be uh, inaccessible to a lot of young people. And how do we prevent that from happening? And so some of the uh, work that was done was then aimed to formalize a lot of the lessons from these spaces into a set of principles. And so Mimi Ito and a lot of her colleagues, both in the academy as well as in practice uh, context, you know, re really amazing uh, educators worked on this uh, framework called the Connected Learning Framework, which influences, uh, I know, a whole line of research here at Data and Society. And it, it sort of called for six design principles. It talked about learning uh, as something that should be interest-powered as something that should be production-centered, really about making either knowledge, artifacts, things that are consequential in the world, uh, supported by peers, having some kind of shared purpose or broader goals that are, 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 are embedded in larger society in some way. Uh, this idea of an academic orientation, which really is about the kind of future career or uh, civic life or academic life, you know, something that is just beyond this moment. And this last idea of, uh, of learning being openly networked, um, that it should be something that connects uh, different spheres of young people's lives and different institutions and settings. And one thing that's interesting if you look at all of these principles is that amongst the first five, you can imagine, say, a given workshop 
or classroom that incorporates all of these first five principles. But that principle of openly networked is implicitly uh, something that takes place across geography and across chronology. It is something that uh, implicates many institutions and contexts from home to community to schools to various institutions and civic spheres. And it, it's something that in, in implicitly needs to happen over time. You're never going to be in those places all at once. And so it's about creating these this kind of layer of open networks um, in uh, across spaces and across time. And the Hive in some ways was an attempt to have that sort of affinity space, open network sort of ecology be something that happens more frequently for young people from non-dominant communities that don't usually have access to the kinds of experiences that maybe kids that are geeking out in fan fiction communities might be uh, uh, getting access to, or um, kids that are from more, more privileged contexts uh, might be getting access to. And so the idea was to sort of take a lot of really powerful uh, organizations under a banner of many, uh, uh, of sort of a, a larger network under the name of Hive to do this work. And so here in New York, there's now over 81 members in the Hive. Uh, everything from kind of cultural institutions from the Museum of Natural History, Carnegie Hall, Museum of Modern Art, um, to kind of smaller organizations, but, but well-known ones like iBeam, um, community-based organizations like The Point, uh, really just kind of a whole bevy of different types of youth-serving organizations that kind of together can create something that wouldn't be possible otherwise in terms of uh, having an openly networked city and to, uh, to create experiences for young people. Important for the story here is also um, uh, the uh, stewardship by Mozilla. So Mozilla is kind of the, the steward of Hive in New York. They've been, uh, Hive has existed in New York since 2009. There's also Hives in a number of other cities, but Mozilla stewards a number of them and they kind of create the connective tissue between all these organizations. So all of, uh, there's kind of community meetups and community calls and uh, there's a whole lot of kind of, there's catalytic funding for projects that comes from a, a separate fund that exists. Um, and the, the Hive sort of talks about itself as a, um, as sort of two things. So the first is uh, an ecosystem of opportunities where young people develop 21st century skills. So this is what uh, Dixie and I sometimes refer to as the network for learning. So it's a network space for learning for young people. And then the second kind of frame on it is uh, this idea of a, a citywide laboratory uh, where organizations collaboratively design connected learning experiences. And so you can't create, the ecosystem of opportunities needs to be created. And so the means of creation is this kind of collaborative process and engagement through lots of these organizations. And you can sort of see um, uh, uh, later like how, uh, I have a little bit of a visualization of how much this actually happens in, in, the, in the city. So uh, these two, uh, ways of, of thinking about the network. The network for learning, that's the opportunities for young people. And the second one is the network that learns. This is kind of the citywide laboratory um, of, of organizations are the two frames that have driven our research project and um, our respective dissertation work, which we're gonna talk about very small pieces of today. And um, I, I think the, the idea hopefully will a lot of this stuff is pretty fresh off of the press, so hopefully uh, you guys will be kind and, and give us uh, kind feedback, literally emerging from our dissertation caves today. Um, but Dixie's work is focused on youth trajectories and pathways and this question of how youth navigate this kind of, uh, these experiences to develop, you know, becoming geeking out kind of kids. Uh, my work focuses a little more on the organizational level of how do you have a network for innovation uh, and what does digital culture play into that? So I'll, I'll pass it over to Dixie to talk about some of her research. Thank you, Rafi. So, hello. Um, I cannot emphasize enough how raw and new this is, and Rafi can cover up that rawness much better than me. So, please let me know if something's not making sense. Um, I actually welcome in, uh, introduction or uh, interruptions during during my my little data bite here. So, um, so I'm going to talk about our youth trajectories and pathways study. And the goal of that, again, was to kind of look at the factors that support uh, long-term interest-driven learning, especially among, amongst um, youth from marginalized communities. Um, and we also wanted to uh, see how Hive programs or the Hive network and everything that we do, how that um, functions as an intervention, how well it, it does in terms of um, Reach, doing, reaching this goal of supporting um, young people's long-term um, interests. Um, here are some photos from a Hive program uh, that's, that's very popular. And I just want to say a few words about the typical Hive program, although they can vary, you know, depending 
um, uh, greatly. There are eight, over 81 institutions. So in general, there are, there are relatively short-term-ish programs that last two months or so. Um, they involve, they have a lot of the connected learning principles embodied in them. They're production-centered. Um, youth engage in um, these digital media making projects that combine design and art, and they're personally meaningful. Um, they, uh, um, there are often these teaching artists that are there who are professionals in the digital media field um, who can share a lot of deep expertise that youth aren't able to find in other places. Um, in this case, um, young people were invited to uh, design a game coded in a Unity 3D environment um, also design a custom gaming controller, connect that to the game through um, uh, an Arduino device. Um, and uh, this young man here, he's one of our use cases, um, we call him Sapphire. Um, instead of making a regular like glove controller, he made a scythe because uh, his character in the game use, uses a scythe. Um, so uh, that's just some general uh, characteristics of the program. Um, they overall, I cannot emphasize enough how amazing these are in terms of the types of specialized equipment youth have access to, the um, instruction, the, the people, the teaching artists that they bond with. These are extremely valued, um, high support times for youth. And sometimes um, these are very rare moments where a young person can find uh, a program that engages in an interest that they had. They couldn't find it anywhere else. Um, so in terms of the methodology, we did case studies of Hive teens, um, high schoolers, recent high school grads. We followed them for six to 12 months. Um, we were looking mainly at their uh, social support, so who was helping them uh, um, maintain this long-term interest um, or this interest in a long-term way. That was just something that emerged after visiting programs and talking to youth. It just seemed uh, to come out in the interviews, so we wanted to just follow that thread. Um, we followed uh, two groups of youth that uh, we'll just loosely call early stage interest and later stage interest. So early stage interest youth, youth were ones, um, youth who were sort of interested in something but didn't have a lot of experience in it. Um, they, you know, they're, they're, they engaged, uh, their motivation was often maybe more friendship driven, uh, they're more consumer oriented, so they're interested in video games and playing video games in um, uh, video game consoles as opposed to production oriented, making games, writing, you know, walkthroughs for, uh, related to games. Um, to connect to the Hamago framework, they're more around hanging out and messing around. Uh, they didn't have as much expertise and their social network around this interest was weaker. Later stage interest, you know, production oriented, they were definitely geeking out. Fair amount of expertise and their social network, and you know, they had mentors, they had peers who also had a fair degree of um, expertise in this interest. Um, that, that was strong, and that became consequential, allowed them to continue um, engaging in, um, in, in activities around this interest over time. Um, in interviewing these youth, we then took um, all their transcripts, coded them, and we came up with a framework of social support. So what are, uh, there, we came up with five areas of social support that, that youth valued and thought were important for their digital media making interests. So the five areas are material support. Obviously, they needed um, like laptops and uh, the Arduino microcontrollers, um, DIY materials that are hard to come by. They really valued being, having access to those types of things. Knowledge building support. So um, not only instructional support around how to get better at an interest, but also understanding more about the field and what that was like. Emotional support, being encouraged. Um, having folks know what you're up to. Brokering support, which is about connecting youth to um, other opportunities and places and institutions uh, that, that um, related to their interests. And then institutional support, so institutional resources like a high program or an internship or an email address from that, you know, from a, a valued institution are all examples of that. So that's sort of the older stuff that we've talked about. This is now where it really becomes new. <laughs> um, I wanted today, today to talk about um, a, kind of a, maybe an interesting phenomenon that emerges when you, when you kind of look at um, uh, the experiences of a later interest youth with an earlier interest youth. And um, I just wanted to illustrate it using these line graphs, which are kind of fake graphs. I didn't really, these don't, um, this is just a represent of an experience. 
Um, so if you look at later interest youth and you sort of um, think about their experience of social support over time, you'll see that there are a lot of peaks. And perhaps the highest peaks are these high programs because they are such rich experiences. But um, these youth are also doing a lot of other things. They're doing things at school. They're collaborating with friends. They you know, found an after school workshop and they engaged in that. And that's largely because of their social network and also they're attracting opportunities because they also have expertise so people are, and they're signaling that they're interested in something. So other people are reaching out to them, letting them know about things. Um, in contrast to that, there's the earlier interest youth who, you know, the high program was definitely the first time they've been, they were able to engage in something. They loved it, but you know, in interviewing them after the program, you see this tremendous drop in support. All the folks that, you know, they were surrounded by during the program, they go away, they didn't keep in touch with them, they don't have access to the same materials and knowledge building support, emotional support, brokering institutional support. So there's this fear drop off. And you might think, and this did happen in some cases, that youth then just didn't continue with that interest because they just didn't know how to. And there's probably other things that they're also interested in and a lot of other, other reasons why that would happen. But you do see that for some youth, they do um, still remain interested in, in that interest enough to um, engage in another high program. And often that was a whole year later, but they, they still somehow, you know, they were there when that program came around again. So. I thought it'd be interesting to look at that space between the, those high peaks. Maybe there are some other smaller peaks that are of social support that are going on. So to look at that, we, we looked at all the support providers in the data set, and we uh, kind of categorized it along two axes. One is along level of relevant digital media knowledge. So how much relevant digital media knowledge did a support provider have um, related to that young person's interest? and then. Um, degree of interactions with youth. So how much shared history? How much did you know the youth? And um, a high teaching artist would obviously uh, rank high in the DM knowledge um, field, but maybe if they've just met the youth, they, would, they wouldn't have a lot of um, interactions with youth. Um, parents, uh, youth told us, were, you know, they knew the youth, they spent a lot of time with the youth, obviously, but they generally didn't have the kind of um, d digital media knowledge that the youth uh, thought was helpful. And then, obviously, we, we would think that we'd want all our support providers to be in that upper right-hand quadrant that we might call the happy place. So then we took that framework and we mapped the um, support providers onto them. And this was in sort of interpretive work. It wasn't, it wasn't through surveys. These were definitely judgment calls on our parts. Um, and we see that there's several types of high DM knowledge folks. Obviously, those high affiliated adults, those teaching artists. Um, there were folks at school, principals, teachers, advisors. Um, and then friends, which could you know, range from having a lot of digital media knowledge to slightly less, and that's why they're kind of like these long um, oblong shapes. Um, in terms of lower digital media knowledge, um, oftentimes, even though in these high programs there were these kids who were geeking out, most of them were sort of kids who were sort of new to the interest. And then, as I mentioned before, yeah, young people repeatedly told us that um, you know, family, adults, and peers, they were, um, they, they did not have the, the kind of experience with this stuff um, that, that the young people craved. So then um, we graphed the support providers in, um, uh, and tried to look at several things at once. <laughs> um, and just look at the top graph for a moment. Um, we looked at, um, we took the support providers tag them by that kind of quadrant, low digital media knowledge, high digital me media knowledge, et cetera. We then also group them by, and this is a standard way of grouping them, you know, family adults, family peers, non-family adults, non-family peers. And then we also had um, counts of uh, how, you know, the, the, the su social support that they provided, material, emotional, knowledge building, et cetera. Um, and the top graph is all the support providers together. Now, when you graph it, based on um, the early interest youth group and the later interest youth group. That's where you see an interesting pattern, um, and I've sort of highlighted it in pink. Um, you see that there's a, a whole swath of support providers that travel to just the early interest youth group. And you also see, and that was the, um, 
basically the family adults, which generally had low digital media knowledge but high history with youth. And then you see another trend. These are the family adults, um, circled in green up here. Not non-family. Hmm? The non-family adults. Oh, sorry, non-family adults. And you see this um, blue band. That those are high digital media knowledge, uh, high history, you know, support providers with high history with youth. And that blue band travels exclusively to the later interest uh, youth group. So that just shows that there obviously are um, real differences in terms of the support, supportive landscape amongst um, these two um, youth archetypes. Um, and this is another way to, to um, communicate that. On the, on the left is the um, mapping of support providers for early interest youth. And you see that um, they, there are a bunch of different groups, including in the green circles, which are the family adults and peers. Nobody's in the happy place. And then in the later interest youth, you see primarily support providers in the upper right-hand quadrant with family adults and peers playing a smaller, definitely a smaller role. Um, and so, and then, but that showed, um, now I'm just gonna move on to just exclusively talk about the early interest youth group. And because um, I, at the top of this talk, I talked about how I was really interested in that space between peaks um, in the early interest youth case and what was happening to keep young, um, these young people interested enough to um, continue with their interest. And um, uh, just a moment ago here on the left-hand side, um, this is the mapping of early interest youth looking at all their support providers across, you know, all of the whole entire span of um, the time we interviewed them. This is actually what it looks like after a program is over. Those folks that might have high digital media knowledge um, but uh, had limited interactions with youth, they often did not stay in contact. So when you're talking about in between those high uh, program peaks, you're really looking at those four circles of support providers offering, offering help. And these are all in that lower right quadrant, which we might think, oh, that's not, um, the, uh, that's not, the, that's not the optimal you know, profile of a support provider. But they were obviously doing something really important. So we wanted to see what they were doing. So we saw that they provided a range of support. Um, they, they, and uh, all this support didn't require a lot of digital media knowledge. So they were providing you know, basic resources, laptops, cell phones, providing internet access. They were providing general encouragement, general feedback on that artifact a young person was making. They noticed that this young person was doing something new and they were being very encouraging. Um, peers were collaborating on a project with the youth. They may not have been you know, those really high technical you know, projects that you see in the high programs, but they were something related to the interest and they were fun, they were keeping the interest alive. And then the final three um, forms of support, uh, we, which we call, which we categorize under brokering support, seem to be especially important. Um, there were people who were sharing information about other programs and people and websites that young people should check out. Uh, they were helping a young person con um, talk about connect their interests to school and career goals, where to go to college, uh, what does this mean in terms of their future goals. Um, some folks even um, invited the student to make a presentation at school and talk about their Hive experience there. So um, we really honed in on this idea of brokering as being a key place where um, everyone, can, um, everyone can help a young person maintain her interest um, and it doesn't require um, a lot of digital media knowledge, and it has um, an important implication in terms of um, uh, um, fulfilling this open, openly networked principle of connected learning because um, brokering connects youth um, between these, these different systems of support in terms of you know, family support, what's happening in the, what the family knows, what the school knows, what after school program. Uh, folks know about a, about a student. Um, it sort of connects all those um, different systems of support together. And it also, in times when within that system there are breakdowns, brokers can also help uh, connect the dots. And in the end, we hope that through more increased brokering, we can enrich youth social networks um, so that they also 
can feel positioned to go out and, and reach and um, find those future learning opportunities. So in conclusion, um, we, uh, we're, we just took this more simplified view, um, this idea that supporting youth pathways is about um, having uh, early stage inter interest youth maintain their interests long enough so that they can um, form the social networks and develop the social support to um, enter into more of a later stage interest. Um, and this can be done through a mix of short bursts of highly specialized support, so these high programs, and then these more sustained periods of general support. Um, and that brokering seems to be an especially effective strate strategy that um, we, we can all be more intentional about um, and that will make a, make a big difference in, the, in this, in um, concerning this. Cool. Thanks, Dixie. So um, I'm going to uh, change tracks a little bit to talk about the sort of other angle on this work, which is more focused on this idea of hives being citywide laboratories. And so this is more the organizational experience um, of how a lot of these high programs are actually come to be produced. These educational initiatives don't come out of thin air. Um, and there's a lot of uh, new interactions that are happening between these organizations to uh, support the creation of these, uh, these learning experiences. Uh, so just to give a little bit of a, a sense, this is a visualization of um, uh, on the left side, it's organizations. On the right side, it's collaborative projects that they engage in. This is just between 2010 and 2012. There's an additional three years of data. So you can see there's quite a lot of collaborative projects that they're working on together that then are experienced by young people one way or the other. Huge amounts of interactions between many, many organizations that are deeply complex, often fraught, sometimes amazing. You know, it's sort of you get the gamut. Um, and, and within this, there's uh, also a lot of organizational learning that's happening. and uh, experimenting with new things. So it is an innovation infrastructure on the organizational level and people are doing things that they, ha they haven't done before and definitely going into areas of work that they haven't previously encountered. Um, and in that process, one of the phenomena that we've observed that's along the lines of the story of the intersection of digital culture and learning is really about specifically the interaction between free and open source software movement and, and that culture and these out-of-school learning organizations. And uh, that's partly because of the stewardship of Mozilla, of this network, that particularly some of these ideas around FOSS come into the mix. And uh, what we call this phenomenon of working in the open in Hive NYC is sort of where this intersection uh, happens. And that intersection is characterized by a process of recontextualization of practices from another cultural location and attendant kind of tensions and contradictions that emerge from um, the, uh, these sometimes culture clash, sometimes there's kind of synthesis. But what I'm going to share here are a couple of cases uh, of that happening. It's, it's important to acknowledge, of course, that um, uh, ideas from open source, uh, as uh, Biela Coleman, who's an amazing ethnographer of digital culture and hackers, uh, talks about FOSS as having norms and values that are characterized by semiotic surplus and elasticity. And we've seen that kind of semiotic surplus and elasticity um, uh, support the circulation of uh, open source practices to a lot of different places in society already. So obviously things that we know like Wikipedia are based on the kind of the peer production work model of open source. Things like Creative Commons take the legal licensure practices of uh, open source and apply them to uh, intellectual property. Um, in closer to our world, this idea of open educational resources exists um, that's maybe a little more focused on creating open stuff. So legally open stuff as well as maybe openly accessible stuff. Uh, but it doesn't, OER doesn't really focus actually a lot on the work practices and the collaborative innovation practices that um, are maybe characterized by something like Wikipedia and peer production. And so Hive, uh, in this case, sort of is operating as a little bit of a context and a case where we can understand how uh, organizational routines and work practices, when they circulate into education, sort of what happens. And what does that look, what does it actually mean in the first place? And what are the, the, the uh, kind of tensions and challenges in, in the second? So I'm going to share um, two cases. One is sort of a positive case of uh, how a working in the open kind of happened in Hive. And the other is one that characterizes a little bit of the, the contradictions and tensions. So uh, there's a project called Hackasaurus that was early on developed, um, sort of led by Mozilla, but very much in the working in the open ethos. It, it wasn't 
there are so many other people involved that to call it a Mozilla project is actually like a little bit um, not uh, doesn't do it justice. Um, and so just briefly, I'm not going to talk so much about what the thing is itself, but just to give you a thumbnail of it, um, Hackasaurus, also known as the X-ray goggles, was basically sort of this uh, a set of curricular activities along with a technological tool where you would kind of click these uh, goggles and suddenly you'd see this mouse over on a web page and you'd be able to then remix a given element on a web page locally. You could replace the, the HTML as in certain new funny pictures, make the New York Times look like there's like, you know, cats with lols all over it and do whatever you want. But the idea behind it was to promote a sort of um, literacy around how the web is designed and how it might be remixed. Uh, the process, though, around developing Hackasaurus was one that was just shot through, through uh, with ideas of openness. And so um, there were all these public forums for prototyping that existed. So Hive organizations like New York Hall of Science would host these big kind of hack jams, and folks from the initiative would come, and they'd, they'd test out sort of early prototypes of, uh, of the tool and the curricular activities uh, in these contexts. Uh, there were public forums for collaboration, open kind of Google listservs, and community calls where pretty much anyone could join in. Sometimes you didn't know who all the people on the call were, even if you were deeply involved in the project, because um, you're like, you know, somebody joins in because it sounds interesting and they found it on the internet. Um, there are public forums for documentation, which if any of you have been in kind of Mozilla world, this bevy of etherpads, which is a sort of open source uh, sort of Google Doc thing, uh, allows uh, lots of people to collaboratively document things that are going on that would be used in the context of things like these uh, prototyping sessions as well as on the kind of calls and, and uh, uh, community forums. And really the, the idea was that there, there was the possibility of engaging a wide range of actors from the Hive network in this process of developing this curricular and technological initiative. Uh, so people like the New York Public Library might uh, host some of these prototyping sessions and also help with some of the curricular uh, aspects of it. NYSI and, and Institute of Play might uh, play a role, you know, giving feedback on the, the tool itself. Mouse uh, eventually came to develop a, a kind of a youth squad that would kind of go and train other educators in using this technology. So there was a lot of fluidity in terms of the roles and being involved in the project. People expressed them, you know, it's like I'm, I'm worried about stepping on each other's toes. Uh, and But th there was generally sort of this way of like, you know, if you want to contribute, contribute. This is a way that you can sort of uh, be involved in a larger project of, of the network. And so from this project, as well as a number of others, we identified a kind of a central set of uh, practices around working in the open that were salient within the context of Hive. Um, the first is this idea of rapid prototyping in actual real world contexts. The second was storytelling and reflection in, in the context of public documentation. The third was enabling community contribution, often through that kind of storytelling process. You, you, have, you create a broader narrative and that allows people to find their way into the process, uh, but also through creating certain kind of infrastructure and like community calls. And lastly, it was more, uh, you know, this is a little bit of a callback to the OER stuff, is creating a remixable innovations. And that operated both on the legal level, but also on the practical level. How do you, you know, make not just the code available, but all the kind of uh, activities and pedagogical approaches available so other people can remix and adapt them in, in some interesting ways. And so if, if Hackasaurus kind of uh, operated as sort of a positive case of uh, working in the open and hive, uh, the second case I'll share is, is one that shows a little bit of the tensions. So uh, I'll, the organization, I'll, I'll just give it the name Media Activism Collaborative. Um, this is their, the, the uh, workshop they're running. They are an organization that is coming from a little bit more of the older youth media world. So they focus largely on youth leadership and activism, social justice issues in the context of media, usually kind of what we might call old media, uh, documentary film, uh, audio interviewing, uh, and radio. Uh, they, as they were coming into the hive and getting more experience with it, they knew that there was something interesting that they might gain by uh, looking towards uh, ways of engagement that came from digital culture and technology and weave them into their work and kind of like, you know, get, get a little bit more uh, uh, interactive in how they did their stuff. So they decided um, and got some initial catalytic funding to um, take an offline workshop that they had really been honing and perfecting over many years that involved uh, creating these kind of like uh, uh, dealing with media history uh, and create an online sort of interactive timeline tool that other organizations that were both youth media organizations or activism organizations could use to do sort of public engagement and public education around issues of policy, history uh, of media, racism, et cetera, whatever kind of social justice you might engage around. So as they're doing this, they're trying to figure out, okay, how do we uh, 
uh, actually figure out. We don't have a lot of capacity around digital media technology, certainly not on the dev side, but also even just on the interaction side. And uh, Mozilla played an active role here in trying to be uh, you know, a knowledge broker of bringing them into context where they might be able to um, figure out how to, uh, how to engage in the strategy and develop this, this interactive tool that they wanted to develop. And so they went, uh, they were invited to come to the Mozilla Festival, which was sort of, if people haven't been, you know, uh, you've probably been to things like it. It's, as opposed to like a traditional conference, it's more like a three-day sprint. You know, there are plenaries and there are some panels, but largely what people are doing there is finding some project to work on and they kind of hack on it for like three days and, you know, maybe they go to some other stuff, but really they're trying to get stuff done. There's a really strong... Uh, orientation towards uh, actually creating something. And, and uh, a quote from one of the Mozilla administrators uh, in relation to the uh, uh, Media Action Collaborative talked about this. So Mike sort of worked with people to make sure they had their projects up and ready and so they could actually come out of the MozFest with a prototype and systems kind of straw man. So this idea of like you're not just going to like attend, you're going to create uh, was really part of it. Um, and the opening kind of plenary the, that year of the festival uh, kind of really kind of nailed that home a little more uh, with the 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 um, uh, the keynote saying "fuck it, ship it," um, and that really making everybody being like, "This is what we're dedicated to doing." Like, get out of the way of your ideas and actually like ship them, get them out there, um, which is a really strong, you know, also uh, indexed in things like less yak, more hack kinds of attitudes that we see uh, in a lot in a lot of the open source world. And so over the course of the weekend, um, the folks from Media Activism Collaborative came there with young people, of course, because that's how they roll. They are, are a youth leadership organization. The youth are leading this process of developing this new interactive technology. They come there with a staff member. They hook up with some kind of cool JavaScript JavaScript developers and some other educators that have a coding background. And they are encouraged to mock up a prototype of this tool, um, which they do. And then at the end of the festival are encouraged to as is the norm, share out with the entire festival on a big stage in front of thousands of people um, the thing that they had come up with and worked on over the course of a couple of days. And what was really interesting for me is that after um, this festival, uh, it was pretty unanimously like agreed on by the people that were participating from MAC that it was not a good experience, that it was really problematic for them and for a lot of reasons. And so I'll, I'll share a little bit of what people said and how it points to particular tensions. So the first tension was around process. Um, uh, this is from one of uh, this is actually from one of the leaders at Mozilla who talked to uh, folks at, at Media Action Cl uh, Media Activism Collaborative. They said they're very hesitant to share the prototype at the festival. They didn't want to share it. They were like, yeah, no, our whole organization has to go through and look at it. We can't make it public. Everyone has to see it first. Um, this makes sense. It's an organization that comes from a documentary background. They're very used to putting out, when they, put, when they release something, it is released. It is the film. It is uh, 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 polished. And they're also coming from a very kind of critical theory, social justice perspective, where you want to be really careful about what you say because your public statements need to index your values. Um, this is a little bit at odds with the kind of fuck it, ship it, put it out there, put it in front of a lot of people within three days, and it didn't go through the kind of organizational channels and processes that they were used to, um, and that caused a, a bunch of tension. The second tension was around audience. Um, so this is one of the leaders from uh, MAC. Uh, she said, if, if they get all that feedback, it's kind of a wash, because it's not who it's for. If you know anything about making media, you know this. Part of our analytic process is that you name your audience, your first tier, your second tier. Uh, you don't just have one, but you know who you're speaking to and who you're in conversation with. And this, again, is a little bit of indexing some of those values around kind of like how documentary uh, and, and, and traditional media producers have this very, very strong orientation towards audience. And also the, just the fact that, you know, they were creating this tool to help activist organizations do work, and those organizations were not present at MozFest. They were not the audience that this tool was made for. Uh, and so the idea that you'd kind of create something, get all this feedback on it in this context was somehow at odds. Um, of course, the ability to gain the expertise to develop a prototype was there at the, at the festival, but the audience that they needed to put it in front of maybe wasn't from their perspective. Uh, so lastly, uh, and maybe most compellingly, was this idea of the safety of young people themselves that were involved in this process. Um, this is, again, the, one of the leaders of MAC. Uh, she says, there's a, a maker culture, there's a hack it, ship it, fuck it, put it out there, uh, which has a tremendous kind of freeing elements and is liberatory on some level. It can play out negatively for kids that are already at a disadvantage. You're not allowed 
uh, young people of color to make something shoddy and show it to the world and go, oh, good little children of color, you made something simple. Uh, she goes on and says, the idea that you can always put stuff out there and have it be open and revealed presumes a level of privilege, to, uh, a certain amount of privilege to negotiate and move through, through the world without severe kickback. So she kind of takes a real kind of classic unpacking the, the, the knapsack of privilege sort of approach to understanding these working open practices and saying like, listen, my kids that are coming from like, you know, pretty non-dominant communities, you know, there are black kids from Brooklyn that, uh, you know, it means something different for them to get in front of a stage and put something out there that doesn't look good than it means for, you know, a bro dude from Silicon Valley. Like, they have a different cultural location. And whether you agree with this or not, this is the experience of the organization. And this is exp the experience of what it means to be engaging with a new culture that ha and, and also something that was developed, a set of cultural practices around open source that were really developed for a particular purpose. And the, the things that these organizations do, these youth organizations do, were developed for another purpose. And so those purposes might sometimes be at odds. There might be some ways to think about resolution of these cultural tensions. Um, and that was something we also saw in, in our data. So this is from a, a Hive administrator after the festival. You know, she was really wanting to know where was the clash? What didn't work about this process of looking at MozFest as a way to create prototypes? Are there places where your methodology and your pedagogical approach really are clashing and don't fit with the way that Hive works? Um, and, and she said, I really want to figure out if people understand what we mean when we talk about open technology and open culture and whether that culture, how it works and how it doesn't. And you know, for, for us, this is part of what it means to be looking at an ongoing unfolding story of the interaction between digital culture and learning and, and education is that you're, you're going to encounter new tensions, you're going to hopefully maybe gain some new practices uh, through the culture inter cultural intersections that occur, and somehow there might be some resolution moving forward. Uh, and that's a story that we're hoping to continue to tell. So I think that's all that we've got for right now. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate your audience. And if uh, you have uh, questions, comments, feedback, we'd really love to hear them. Questions? So I guess I'm going to start. Um, DC, I'm sort of interested in this uh, you know, question of providing support, in part because I think about a New York Times article that came out. I think about a New York Times article that came out a couple weeks ago reporting on a series of different research um, that has showed that when people have anxiety about, uh, this is particularly around math, when people have anxiety around math and they try to provide support on homework and other such things, that they end up undermining kids' engagement um, in math. And actually you see scores decline um, for parents who are anxious about math trying to provide support for math. And so one of the things I'm curious about is what does it mean when you have these, uh, you know, well-intentioned, uh, supportive family members who may not know anything about technology, and what are they implicitly imparting to some of the communities that, or to some of the kids that they're talking to? Um, so I think that in, uh, there was a range of uh, support or um, that had good or bad outcomes coming from family members, so it's really great that you bring that up. And, Part of it has to do with that long history that they have with youth. So um, uh, we, I didn't focus on negative examples, but it did come out and it was kind of interesting to reflect on. For example, um, uh, one young woman said, you know, her mom doesn't really, um, you know, take her interests seriously. And I thought that was odd. But then it turned out, you know, if you think about it, this mom has seen this young person go through many different interests. And in fact, through high school, she was very focused on a certain type of interest, uh, law. She did mock trial. Um, she applied to a college um, to, with the intention of going to the law program. And then she does this summer program. She comes back. She's like, I want to be a filmmaker. And so it's fair to say, you know, for this parent to say, you know, what are you talking about, you know? And then. <laughs> And then there's also issues around, you know, evaluating this field. So filmmaking, that seems kind of like a freelance thing versus law, which I feel like would be better for you, you know. And then you contrast that with um, these teaching artists who might be, you know, like a filmmaker who is a freelancer who's fighting really hard to pay the rent and they see a young person wanting to be a filmmaker they're going to be supportive, right? Because no one, you know, you really crave that support from people. That's what's kept you going. So it's almost kind of like this historicity stuff that really comes into play in terms of 
um, how how people approach social support, and uh, and then that can have effects in terms of how it's interpreted and how how um, it's met by students. Hey, just going off of what Dana was saying and exactly what you're saying, and also going back on your point about culture shifts. Um, so I'm wondering a little bit about your research and how much you included culture within that, because when you're saying, you know, someone's coming home and saying they want to be a filmmaker based upon some uh, program they went to, my thought process is immediately, what is the culture of this young person? Because in many cultures, and especially like low socioeconomic cultures, as well as communities of color, coming home and saying you want to be a filmmaker is not a viable option. Right. Yeah, exactly. And these were ethnographic case studies. So we definitely did bring context into play. The findings became much more interesting when we did that. And so um, we did try our best to understand how culture came into play, how, how things like um, shared history came into play. Um, we didn't want to make a judgment call in terms of, you know, being a filmmaker was better than you know, being a lawyer, uh, we really just wanted to understand uh, the motivations, um, the inner logics in terms of why a person reacted uh, the way they did. And they, they did play a big role in terms of uh, uh, whether a young person continued with an interest, you know, family, and, but in also weird ways too, like, you know, uh, a young woman might have a history of tension with her mom so when her mom says I don't really support what you're doing you know that can play out differently than when they have a close relationship uh, or whatnot so yeah. that for sure that definitely played a role and I can I can say the you know not just from our research but from other folks uh, specifically folks at CU Boulder uh, have looked at sort of when you look across many interests uh, the cultural shifts around new sectors coming uh, into play that didn't exist before has a really big mediating effect on how legible those spaces and fields are for young people that might be interested in them. So uh, what folks at CU Boulder found was that uh, for kids that were, say, interested in science, that uh, career trajectory is highly legible and it's pretty ha highly regimented in a lot of parts of society. And it's, pr it's, it's easier for both people trying to be supporting as well as for youth to see what it might look like. Whereas being in sort of new media spaces, um, the, 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 the geography uh, of those careers is being written as we are speaking right now uh, in a way that it's, you know, and obviously everything's always in shift but and in flux, but there isn't, a, a, you know, as much of an established grammar for them to hook onto. And so we found that there's kind of some interesting mediational effects of what your interest is based on, uh, you know, how those cultural effects or are, 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 are cultural shifts are happening on a more macro level in society. And just to add on to that really quickly, it was interesting in terms of um, how young people learned about the wider culture of this digital media, media field they were interested in pursuing or, or entering um, without um, a, a social network of you know, actual people they could ask questions of. It was interesting that a lot of youth took cues from popular culture. So you know, one woman told me all about what it was like to be a filmmaker and she learned this from watching Gossip Girl, because there's a character there who's a filmmaker. Um, and there's also, you know, watching uh, YouTube videos about, you know, coding video games, you know, and that was where they draw a lot of their, you know, information about what it might be like. So I thought that was interesting, too. Sort of a nuts and bolts kind of question. So I, I've recently returned to New York after a few years in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I was uh, involved in the Hive Learning Network and, and loved it and was great. Um, I'm curious, uh, what kind of mechanisms do you guys have in place to incorporate the research that you do back into these Hive Learning Networks? Are, are there, do you have regular meetings? What, mm -hmm. what goes on? Yeah, so that's a whole line from our work that we didn't talk about, uh, which is that we are actually an applied lab which means that we're not just producing basic research, but we're figuring out how to also uh, put it into practice. Um, we use a lot of different mechanisms. The kind of three features of our model on the applied side are embeddedness, uh, 
uh, collaborative design and diverse formative knowledge sharing. What that basically means, embeddedness is that we are around and part of the community here in New York in the Hive, so we are not separate and apart, but we are actually uh, engaging in all the communal spaces of the Hive here. Um, Co-design really looks at sort of doing actual design research experiments, but coming up with what they are with community members in the network. So this isn't basic research, it's sort of like, we'll come and we'll bring particular problems to the table, maybe it's problems around brokering, maybe it's problems around, say, working in the open and knowledge circulation, and we'll create sort of sprints and hack jams where we come up with uh, uh, research-based and evidence-based approaches to trying to solve those problems, and then we'll work with them to do um, uh, sort of uh, uh, these experiments where we act as sort of data collectors and help to iterate based on the data we collect. Uh, diverse formative knowledge sharing is basically like we don't just clock in once a year with a report. So we are constantly presenting on community calls and conference calls. We are holding uh, our own meetings. We are putting out one pagers and two pagers as opposed to just 60 pagers uh, that are out there and, and really experimenting with what kinds of knowledge is most useful um, and having to also contend with like, okay, what are the uh, pressures of the account? Academy and what does the academy want and what does the network want? Um, but we do, that's a big part of our work in a whole realm that we call research practice partnership model uh, that we pay a lot of attention to and actually have an explicit line of research on. So we're researching that process itself of how do you be a good research actor within a big distributed network of lots of communities and lots of institutions. And one aspect of engagement that I really enjoyed uh, when I talked oh, about yeah. brokering, uh, there was like a, a image of maybe it was a white image of a white paper that was actually a community developed white paper it it was uh, the culmination of like seven months of um, you know uh, periodic meetings face to face calls presentations that slowly led to a google doc and then you know invitations to have folks add their thoughts to the google doc and over 60 folks from hive nyc alone part, you know um, engaged with that and then uh, multiple, you know, drafts, and then we finally produced that. And that was that was a really satisfying way to talk to folks about this issue of brokering, hear their thoughts, um, and then in the process, everyone is sense making and learning. So it, that was that was a great um, endeavor, and it also had a lot of interesting tensions as well. So maybe down the road we can. Yeah, it was a little bit of uh, applying some of the, these ideas of working in the open to our, 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 the engagement model around our research and the ideas that we're putting out there. And the idea that you know, over you know, six, you know, 60 to 70 organizations can be involved in the development of a 25-page you know, white paper, which to us was a really fascinating uh, way to think about how research and practice should be uh, kind of intertwined. And, and also how, our, how the ideas that we're starting as seeds can be built on and made more relevant to the people that we're trying to, to work with. Because we know that if we just go into our data and we kind of just come up with a paper, then it's not it's inevitably not going to be nearly as contextualized as what happens after you have 60 organizations, you know, you know kind of tearing it for, for, for three or four months before you actually put it out there. So yeah. Hi. Um, so Rafi, this this the last point you made about how youth of color like kind of, that there was a, a tension between this idea of failure, right? And like yeah. how that has a different valence if you come from a disadvantaged background. I thought that was a super interesting point. And it reminded me a little bit of this like internet meme -y thing that went around a while ago, like really nerdy internet meme about like the statistical software signal. It was about how if you like if you code in R, then that means you're like creative and smart and whatever. But if you code in like more of an off-the-shelf product like Stata, then like what that tells us is that you know you don't know you don't really know what you're doing, you don't know your data, blah blah blah, right? Like all these assumptions and then like there was this feminist critique of that meme saying like okay well yeah but it also could just mean that like you went to a school like that you didn't have the resources to really like try right or you didn't have the resources to um, you know experiment a lot with these kind of open frameworks and that and what you said really made me think about how like yeah there's this like very strong ethos of openness and agility but that the, that carries with it this kind of assumption of privilege or assumption that failure is like an okay thing that you know it's part of the process and so like given that, given that you guys learned that and given that like your own, like you guys just talked about how your own framework is sort of integrating these insights back into your own work, like what do you do with that now? Like how can you, I mean, yeah, how do you like reform the process or something? I mean, given that like these are big problems that you can't solve from the outset, like economic inequality is not something you can single-handedly solve. Like is there a way to sort of reform like 
you know, like maybe the, the structure of those hackathon festival things or something to sort of account for the way that they're differentially impacting different groups? Yeah, I, it's a really interesting question and I haven't fully, I can't say that I, I really know the answer. <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of what I've seen, uh, you know, so w I think one of the things that's actually interesting about the, uh, the case that I gave is that the, the two sets of quotes, the folks from the kind of Mozilla administrator and the folks from the organizational leader at MAC, like those people are extremely close to this day. They're, they're really, they work together enormously. So something is clearly right in what they've done <laughs> to figure out how to resolve these tensions. And I think a lot of it, and you know, maybe it's too specific to this case, but a lot of it was just that everyone involved was really interested in the breakdowns. <laughs> everyone involved was really interested in what went wrong. Um, and even when you know, they talked about actually how hard it was to even marshal the resources to figure out what went wrong, there was still knowing that there was a commitment on both sides of all the actors involved that they wanted to figure it out and wanted to know, I think does make a, a really big difference. And I think one of the things that's really wonderful about a place like the Hive Network is that you know, you've got all these organizations that are always in, you know, direct, you know, a lot of them are working, ton, doing tons of direct service with young people. Like, it, they, they smell bullshit pretty quickly. And so I think, and, and, and the, for me, the process of resolution in a place like Hive comes from the fact that if you develop the network right, and sometimes it gets it right and sometimes it doesn't, you have enough trust in the system where people are able to, when they smell bullshit, to tell you or to tell you know, others. I mean, I can say, I, I don't remember uh, anyone in the process of our own application of these principles around working open, let's say the development of these white papers, anyone saying to us like, well, you, this is problematic in XYZ ways. I, I can't remember that happening, but I feel like if there was, people probably would have told us, not to say that we don't have any cultural location and power and that people might be af you know, afraid for one reason or another to say something, but a lot of it does come down to the fact that if you have a really trusting system and a trusted system, that you can actually just, uh, once you make the contradictions legible, then they're tractable, right? Um, if they're invisible, they're intractable. So I think that's sort of, you know, maybe too, a little bit of a social answer, but uh, it's, it's what I've seen worked. You know? I think there was somebody up here. Um, I'm sort of thinking things as a bit of a bigger picture. I mean, th there can always be more data, and I'm sort of thinking, do we maybe need to enrich the data quite a lot further and have a have a bigger picture, and whether we're being a little bit more reactive than proactive in regards to who we're targeting. I'm not too sure if the data in particular that we're looking at and discussing of the, the groups within it and where the gaps are and is from, I guess, the project itself, and just looking at from the people that came to be involved in these projects, is that the only data scale that we're looking at? And just sort of these conversations of sort of discussing culture and what can come out of culture. We think a lot about underprivileged, but I guess I've, I've had a lot of experience in, in Japanese education. I went to Japanese universities and looking at that. And it's almost a, sometimes there's a question of overprivileged as well. Um, and some children have opportunities handed to them, but that's the only opportunity that they've been given. They haven't been given the idea to see any other opportunities available. So we might look at a, a child that really understands and is passionate about something that they'd like to do, and they've been given all the tools in the world to be able to do this, and that's what they want to do. But I think it's these days we might want to look at giving children the opportunities of, of choice as well. So I think what's fantastic is, I guess, these Hive programs are giving opportunities of choice to a child that doesn't have maybe any choices presented to them, where it would be great to have some opportunities to children that might have had other, other things presented to them to be able to present everything. So I'm just sort of thinking in ways of, is, is there data being looked into to research to be able to look at maybe a whole scale or, or to look at a whole school of children and say, okay, what are you involved in? What, is there anything out of school that you're involved in, something like Hive or why? There could be a cultural barrier, there could be a, a simple language barrier of not being able to, to have the understanding. Um, quite commonly, there's, there's parents of schools where the child can speak perfect English, but the parents can't, and the parents are the ones that have the access to give the children this knowledge. So I'm just wondering if sort of looking at the, the bigger picture of the gaps, and then potentially how we can fill that gaps, and then mm -hmm. delving deeper and sort of saying, okay, well, the gap could be something like Hive. Now, how can we make this really, um, really effective, so, mm -hmm. yeah. I think, uh, I mean, I can say really briefly, I, mean, I think the brokering model here is really, uh, so one of the things that we did, um, I don't know if I can actually pull it up, but one of the things that we did was that uh, 
we uh, worked out sort of a little bit of a, a conceptual model of uh, what are the mediating factors towards um, actually those moments of brokering and uptake of opportunities. And so there are things on the, uh, uh, this is coming from the perspective of if I'm an educator in a program being a broker, because that's who we're targeting in this case, but it could be applied to a lot of other individuals that might be learning brokers. Um, and really looked first at this kind of importance of relationship building between those two people, how that builds trust of the adult uh, by young people, so they're more likely to take up a recommendation, and how it also builds transparency into the young person's interests by the adults so they can make a good recommendation for them. But then on their ability to make a good recommendation is mediated by what do they even know about? <laughs> you know, what do you, if, you, if you were just, if I was to ask you right now, okay, what opportunities for a kid who is interested in filmmaking exist around the city? I don't know you very well, but I doubt you'd be able to list a five off the top of your hand. I know this stuff super well and I can't list five off the top of my hand. I can tell you organizations to go to, but the process of having inf informational transparency, transparency of the ecology is a big challenge for people that will be learning brokers. And then on the youth side, the youth's own network orientation, like how likely they are to signal and seek help and think about the idea of like, yeah, I can go and find a next opportunity uh, is another thing that kind of mediates that. I think it doesn't fully tell the whole story. I think part of what you're also interested in in your question or comment was that how do you even think about what will lead to a kid be uh, uh, a kid having choices and being able to make certain choices and what is what are the possibility spaces in front of them but we think that part of this model sort of starts to get at some of those questions i don't know if that helps yeah this model was um you know, it took a while to get to even this model, but then the more we look into this issue of brokering, the more we realize how, in a lot of ways, it's incomplete, or there's places to add more things, like the the barriers you were talking about, which definitely exist. And yeah. what's nice is that because we put this out there and we tried to disseminate it widely, it got picked up by an assistant principal at a school, and he decided he wanted to um, use this sort of modeling, this model as a stepping stone to talk to his advisors in the school and create um, kind of a system, kind of a systematic inquiry into how to be better brokers for all the youth in the school. Because right now they were seeing how there was a lot of familiar faces that were going off to do to to do these after school programs, but they wanted to really figure out um, how to get everyone involved and what are the issues, you know, transportation, cultural barriers. Um, things like that, and um, and we're we're hoping to maybe um, observe and try to help them understand. And it's that perfect research design where it's a whole school, and you can kind of see also the the positive examples as well as the less positive ones. So, do, um, excuse me. Do you have any visibility um, for the kids that have already been through the program? And I know you've focused on the the importance of brokering. But do you have any visibility on kind of five years out, kind of what's what's happening and, and you know how, how the the program is is, is worked? Um, so that's one question, and, and and the second question is, and I think you started to get to it in talking about this assistant principal. What's the role for public policy? Do, do you see? Have you, have you looked into that, or kind of public support for these types of programs? Yeah, I mean, um, sorry, the first part of your question. Uh, I'll yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, five years out would be amazing. And I, I would love to do that. I haven't done that yet. I would have to probably go to, um, you know, hive educators who are still in touch with, with some youth and do like a historical interview. And I would really love to do that. Um, some of these youth, because I'm taking so long to finish my dissertation, <laughs> I've, I've actually known now for, you know, like 16 months, right? Um, and uh, I picked an interesting time to follow them because it was like senior year in high school and then first year community college. And man, I mean, things t completely changed. They entered a new system. Uh, they, a, lot, a lot of things did not work well for them. Um, classes around you know, video, video editing at a community college turned out to be really uninteresting you know, and really you know, uh, affected their, their, their ideas about truly what what they really wanted to do with life, with their lives. Um, so I think it is really interesting to follow, uh, continue following them, and also to to pick times when there's these important like transition moments. Because I think that that um, the next question around policy, I think that that could really attend to that. And I would love to talk to more community colleges 
Um, I was talking to Mark about that um, last time I was here in terms of trying to see if we could bring more awareness of what we're seeing in high programs and what's working well in terms of those, you know, structuring those uh, programs around connected learning and, and as productive affinity spaces and how to maybe get community colleges to structure some of their learning environments in that way too. I think that'd be a really powerful next step for our project. On the, on the public policy question, I mean, one of the things that we have started to look into is, you know, the city invests massive amounts of money uh, into, say, su summer youth employment programs. Uh, this, this year is $90 million and thousands and thousands of youth employed. Largely, almost entirely, like, no matching between actual interests and, and, and what the opportunity is. It's a really broken system when it comes to the ability for a young person that has a particular interest to really be very well matched. It, it's sort of often like, you know, you kind of, you're hoping for a summer job and it doesn't really take attention to this kind of youth-centered view of like, oh, what do I actually really want to do with my life? And so we've started some discussions with uh, people that are connected to those systems to try to figure out, even on kind of like a, a, the, the structuring of like the UX of the application for the summer youth employment program. God, I mean, it looks like every other government website in the world, i.e. it's horrible. Um, and you know, you think about a kid from Brownsville who's trying to figure that out and it's like, forget it. Um, let alone actually try to have it be a pleasant experience that makes them uh, uh, be able to connect to some kind of interest they have to the, what, what kind of opportunities are available there. Um, I think there's an, another big, there's a lot of things around um, connecting these many institutions. So like having you know, this vision of having like sort of school speak to all these out of school organizations, speak to you know, uh, you know, plenty of kind of community context is still a vision that's in many ways largely unachieved and pretty tough to achieve. And I think a lot of the work that's happening here at Data and Society around the Enable and Connected Learning Initiative focuses on these issues of student data privacy, partly because like, when you're going to try to connect all these institutions, what does connection mean? Connection means that somebody's collecting data about a kid that's going to travel with them in some way, or and who's going to own that, and what, what are going to be the implications of that, and what are, the, what are the, the, the implications of safety for young people who are non-dominant in that kind of case? Forget like presenting at the end of a conference and having this huge data trail behind you that maybe is good and maybe is not good, and who's looking at that? Um, so I think that, you know, there's opportunities on the public policy level, on the big systems and institutional level to create better connections between a lot of the consequential institutions that would help to maybe collectively support a youth long-term pathway, but it is fraught, fraught with a, a lot of privacy issues. And so I think the work you guys are doing is critical and we really want to see what comes out of it. Should I just yell? Oh, oh hey, I don't need to yell. Um, I think it's really cool what you've done over the last few years. Um, I guess I'm working at one end of the branch that you just articulated. So um, here coming up with a curriculum for CUNY students, um, uh, public university students here in New York City, for those of you who don't know what CUNY is, and essentially uh, putting them to work in community boards and to really think through how could um, the civic engagement process as well as constituent services be reinvented. Um, and so I just find it interesting, um, and I hate saying the, the se section of words because as an academic that's really not saying really anything uh, other than I'm going to say something critical, I find that there's a complete disconnect between what's happened since 2009 around civic hacking uh, and kind of giving people who have tech tools uh, and empowering them to engage with government and kind of this connected learning world. And so how... When do we get together and start partying and planning? Um, when do we do that? Well, it's, it's interesting because, you know, historically, if you look specifically to the field from, fields from which uh, kind of connected learning and uh, emerged from, it was sort of this broader initiative in digital media and learning very broadly that took a very kind of like social cultural perspective uh, on, di on digital technology and kids it really always had quite a strong orientation around civic engagement. So there was always a really uh, serious attention to what are the civic effects of technology for young people, how uh, might we understand new modes of civic engagement. Folks like Henry Jenkins did tons of work on the relationship between fan cultures and activism and kind of the Harry Potter alliance and things like that. But you're right that there wasn't actually that's sort of a, a, it's a close, it's a closeness to what you're talking about, but that the particular civic hacking piece that you're talking about in terms of engaging public policy and technology and having 
in this case, maybe young people uh, involved in that process, it's, it's, doesn't, it's not that it doesn't exist at all, but it's totally underexplored. And I think what's, uh, there's a great opportunity because so many of the organizations in the Hive often place their young people in, like I was talking about in the case of MAC, in the roles of designers and innovators where they're not just like the subjects mm -hmm. of an educational experience, but are actually involved. I actually found in an analysis of over 100 project proposals that a full 45% of them had youth uh, that were playing a role in the innovation process around the, what was being proposed in, uh, in the proposal itself. And so there is a massive appetite for that mode of engagement of youth leadership and youth innovation that I think you should actually tap into and come to a Hive Youth Meetup and talk about. It. Sound good? Yes. Great. Yes. <laughs> totally out of power. Um, and so with that, I know we are at time. I want to say thank you um, to Rocky and Dixie. This is absolutely great. I'm sure we'll stick around for a few minutes. So um, very much. Thank you, Dana. Thank you.